I'm late. I had to stop by the Wax Museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again, you've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. <laughs> well, we ain't killing their army, but well, we killing them. We be on CNN like say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, introducing Mohammed Sahini. He is a professor of chemical engineering at USC and an Iranian expat and an expert on uh, American and Iranian foreign policy um, and a very good writer on nuclear issues and all kinds of uh, issues regarding America and Iran's relationship going back many years now. And here he is again at antiwar.com. Pompeo's ridiculous crocodile tears for the Iranian people. Welcome back to the show, Mohammed. How are you doing, sir? I am fine. Thank you for having me to return to your great program, Scott. Well, I'm really happy to have you here. It's been way too long since we've spoken, and this is such a great article. Uh, Mike Pompeo went and gave a speech in Southern California last week where, uh, well, what do you say? Well, first of all, it is important to notice who his audience was. Half of his audience, who were Iranian, were uh, basically old Iranian monarchies that are typically very rich and a sick dream of going back to power after 40 years uh, of after revolution. The other part were basically uh, rich Iranian Zionists that support Israel. Uh, from the reports that my friends gave me, uh, they were also supporters of MEK, the uh, opposition organization that uh, was listed by the State Department as a terrorist organization up until 2011. But now because of uh, John Bolton being a uh, national security advisor and Rudy Giuliani being uh, an attorney for the president, uh, both of whom uh, have been uh, basically lobbying for MEK, uh, it has sort of become the darling of uh, a Trump administration, apparently, and uh, it is being promoted directly or indirectly. Uh, Pompeo basically wanted to express the support of the administration for Iranian people, or supposedly. But when you look at the history of who Pompeo is and what they want to do, it is totally laughable to think that these people uh, are supportive of uh, Iranian people. And God knows Iranian people do need help, but not the type of help that they want uh, to offer them. So if you want to look at what uh, he said one by one, uh, uh, first of all, let's start with the fact that uh, both uh, Pompeo and Bolton are very well-known uh, Islamophobe. Uh, for example, Pompeo, before becoming uh, Secretary of State or CIA Director, uh, had very close relationship for, uh, with uh, Center for Security Policy. And we know Center for Security Policy is led by Frank Gaffney. And Frank Gaffney is one of the uh, worst or probably worst Islamophobe uh, uh, in the United States. Uh, Bolton uh, was previously the chairman of Gatestone uh, Institute. And Gatestone Institute is, is a far-right organization that, for example, uh, uh, claimed that uh, Muslim immigrants uh, in Europe heralded a great white death in Britain. It also claimed that they have uh, turned uh, Britain into an Islamist uh, uh, colony. Uh, Bolton was also su supportive of a uh, uh, baseless allegation against uh, Homa Abedin, uh, the Muslim uh, uh, lady that was an, uh, uh, an aide to former 
Hillary Clinton. So they both both of them have been have been very well known Islamophobe, and in fact they have made is uh, uh, you know Islamophobia uh, sort of mainstream so that other people uh, also uh, speak about it uh, more more freely. Now, given this history, Pompeo uh, sheds tears for Iranian people from a nation uh, of 83 million people. Uh, 98% of them uh, are are Muslim. And in fact, even though uh, the uh, government in Iran has used uh, religion uh, in political ways that is opposed by a vast majority of people, uh, Iranian people are still very much uh, religious, observant, uh, and practicing Muslim. So it is so totally ridiculous that the guy who has a whole history of being against Muslim and Islam, and in fact he himself is sort of a fundamentalist uh, Christian. Uh, when he was CIA director, uh, they said that he started having uh, prayer sessions every day at the CIA headquarters. So a guy with this background now uh, sheds tears for uh, for Iranians. So that's one 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 aspect of it. The other aspect is we both know that Pompeo and Bolton in the past uh, uh, have called for bombing Iran. Uh, Bolton wrote that infamous uh, article, uh, published art, uh, op-ed in, in the New York Times, in which he called uh, for bombing Iran. And he said, uh, to prevent Iran bomb, which has never existed, bomb has repeatedly called for uh, U.S. attacking Iran or Israel attacking Iran or both of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, Pompeo, when he was a congressman, uh, talked about bombing Iran, and uh, he said explicitly that he thinks that 2030s over Iran, um, bombing Iran, will get rid of all of Iran's uh, nuclear uh, nuclear program. But and of course, we know that if that happens, Iran will respond, and that will uh, start a huge war. Uh, that will engulf the entire Middle East. Uh, yeah, 2,000 sorties, is that all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, yeah, he talks as if 2,000 sorties is, is, is nothing. So um, uh, at the same, so, so, so this is another aspect of this guy. Now, we also know that ever since Trump uh, uh, began his presidency, he had wanted to uh, ban Iranians as uh, people of one of the seven Muslim countries to enter the United States. And uh, we have hundreds of thousands of Iranians living in the United States, uh, probably even more, uh, around 1.5 million, uh, who have relatives, parents, loved ones, and so on, living in Iran. And now they cannot visit, they cannot get visa. And not only them, uh, a lot of uh, educated, uh, a lot of uh, a talented young Iranian man and woman who want to come to this country to continue their studies mm-hmm. uh, cannot get visa also. As a professor at USC, I have admitted several highly talented Iranian students to come to the United States and do their doctoral thesis with me. None of them uh, uh, received visa, even mm-hmm. though these people, these young uh, people, uh, are highly talented and they they were so good that the, my university, University of Southern California, gave them, uh, you know, PhD scholarships, but they never got, uh, they never got a visa. And, and that's such an important point too, because we always hear, well, if if you look in the right place anyway, or listen in the right place, you always hear that the Iranian people love Americans and they love America. It's just our government that they hate, just like me, right? Just like all of us. Exactly. Um, I, and yet, I love the American. Republic myself. I mean, I have lived in this country for 40 years. I am an American citizen, and I don't want this country to get into a useless war that would... Uh, well, and even, their- I'm just talking about the Muslim ban here, where, you know, the reason why they love us is because so many of them have been able to come here and get educations and then go home and tell everybody, exactly. you know, America's not too bad. It's just their government, you know? Exactly, exactly. So that's another aspect. Uh, they ban Iranians from coming to this country, and uh, and especially young people who were great ambassadors for the United States right. uh, when they returned to Iran, saying that we, we lived there, we got a great education, and so on, and yet they claim to be a uh, friend of Iranian people. 
Now, they also talked about how uh, the nuclear agreement with Iran and JCPOA didn't address uh, other aspects of what they're concerned about, from uh, Iran's presence in Iraq and Syria to violation of human rights in Iran. But these are all bogus, in, uh, in my view, not only in my view, in the view of uh, many uh, uh, other people and experts and, and analysts and so on. So take, for example, the issue of uh, human rights violation. Okay, all Iranians know that the uh, government in Tehran has violated human rights of uh, Iranian citizens. I mean, this is, this is very clear. And in fact, I have uh, published articles uh, about these violations myself, many, many articles. Uh, but the, the point is, that's not concern of Pompeo or Trump or Bolton, because if they really care about uh, human rights and its violation, then the United States should not have any relation with Saudi Arabia which is one of the worst dictatorships uh, in, in all of the world, not just the Middle East. Uh, it is a dictatorship in which people don't vote. There is no parliament. Uh, there is supposedly a consultative assembly, but it has no power. And there, there, are, there is basically uh, a quiet war uh, going on, uh, waging by the Saudi government against its uh, Shiite citizens. Uh, that uh, constitutes about uh, 15% of the population. Uh, if the United States really uh, cared about uh, human rights, it would not help Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates uh, to bomb Yemen for three years, uh, committing what many human rights organizations, including Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, uh, consider as war crimes uh, in Yemen. And not helping it to, uh, you know, to uh, put Yemen, which is a very uh, poor country, that before the war started uh, uh, imported 90 percent of its food from, uh, you know, from other countries, uh, to to go hungry, uh, and to have uh, cholera uh, become an epidemic where one at least one million people have been inflicted by it, uh, and Yemen has been basically destroyed. Saudi Arabia intentionally bombs farms and factories and schools uh, and so on. So this, this is the type of regime that this administration is supporting, and yet it claims to care about, uh, uh, you know, violation of human rights uh, in Iran uh, by the Iranian government. Which, yeah. of course, as I said, it is, it, is, it is very much true. But Iran, at the same time, also has a very strong uh, social movement against these violations. And there, there is always a struggle between human rights uh, advocates and defenders in Iran and the government. And in fact, uh, they have had some major success against it also. Uh, one example uh, that I can mention, for example, is in the elections last year uh, for city council around Iran uh, uh, from a very important city, uh, a non-Muslim, uh, was elected by people to representative in the city council. Uh, but the uh, Guardian Council that uh, basically monitors uh, uh, these elections uh, disqualified him from taking his seat uh, in the city council. And that created a huge uproar, and eventually he went to uh, uh, Iranian parliament and the assembly of... Ex uh, and, and to... Uh, uh, to another uh, uh, constitutional assembly that uh, mediates between the Guardian Council and the Parliament. And just a few days ago, they voted that uh, the non-Muslim uh, elected uh, person uh, should take uh, his seat in, in the city council of Yaz, a major city in central Iran. So this is uh, the type of uh, uh, struggle that you, Iranian people have had uh, and, uh, in the Islamic Republic uh, of Iran over there. Uh, and, it, it, and while I, I totally support uh, giving Iranian uh, people inside Iran uh, moral support uh, in their struggle for human rights, but this, should, this support should come from uh, credible people, credible government, credible organizations, not from uh, an administration that has been uh, supporting a criminal war in Yemen, in Yemen, has invaded Afghanistan, 
uh, Iraq, uh, bombed Libya, uh, uh, provided support for terrorists in, in Syria. Uh, uh, President Trump is, is infatuated with uh, a dictator in the Philippines uh, who has uh, you know, stated clearly that he has killed people uh, himself, and so on and so forth. So this is all... This is all, uh, you know, bogus, mm-hmm. bogus claims. Well, let me ask you this, Mohammed. Um, you know, they say, and, you know, as you're saying, the, the current regime there, it is a tyranny. Um, they do violate human rights. And, um, you know, uh, Phil Giraldi and Peter Van Buren and some of our other uh, friendly anti-war guys went to Iran recently uh, for a conference. And Giraldi told me on the phone the other day, there's a lot of discontent against the regime there. So what about the possibility that motives aside, obviously, you know, you've made a strong case. And I agree with you wholeheartedly that John Bolton and Mike Pompeo don't give a damn about the Iranian people. However, um, you know, is it possible there's this land a story in Reuters, of course, um, about their efforts to sow instability and dissent there. And there's this new working group that they've set up to try to figure out how to destabilize Iran again. Um, Maybe that could work. Maybe the Ayatollahs really are on their last legs. Maybe the Iranian people are sick and tired and all they need is a little bit of a push from the USA. What do you think? Well, according to what I understand, their plan is to completely ruin Iranian economy. That would lead to people revolting. And then they hope that when they revolt, if they do revolt, uh, then, uh, you know, the uh, states, uh, military forces, uh, the IRGC and so on, will be used to put down the, the revolt. And then that would provide an excuse, uh, like Libya, for example, for so-called humanitarian intervention. They also believe that if that happens, MEK can uh, can actually uh, uh, take over uh, take over Iran. Uh, now, there is no question that there is discontent in Iran, and this discontent is uh, at, at at least right now. Uh, is mostly about uh, the economic situation. Now, that economic situation was also created in part by the United States because the, the sanctions that were imposed in, uh, on Iran not only deprived Iran of, of many uh, you know, commercial relationships that Iran had with the outside world, but it also gave rise to... Uh, uh, or contributed at least to the deep corruption that Iran had during the Mahmoud Ahmadinejad administration. Because in order to get around the sanctions, uh, they had uh, to resort all sorts of things. And most of these was what uh, people like me called Iran's deep state, the, the network of intelligence and military uh, officers behind the scenes that pull, pull a lot of strings, and they only report to... Uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, the, uh, the supreme leader. So they, cre- they, they there was black market from which they benefited. There were uh, illegal jetties that they had uh, created and in- imported a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, cheap stuff uh, from China and other places and made themselves fabulously rich. And they stole a lot of money. Now, the Rouhani administration came to power and started uh, rooting out these corruption, and every day we hear, uh, we hear, you know, revelation about a new case of uh, corruption that took place uh, a few years ago. Now, the other important thing is that we had uh, last February, uh, uh, last uh, January, we had demonstrations in several Iranian cities against bad economic situation. But these demonstrations were not actually supported by Iran middle class. If you look at uh, the composition of demonstrators, which uh, were uh, in many, many cities, but their number were very uh, small, uh, it's estimated that overall, on average, in every city, about 2,000 people uh, had demonstrated. If you look at that, it was mostly from poor people. But the middle class and the upper class uh, did not support the demonstration, not because they are happy with what's happening in Iran, and you know, at least in terms of economic uh, 
conditions and so on. But but all but because they despise uh, President Trump and his administration, and think that the Trump administration is trying to incite uh, uh, you know chaos in Iran, uh, which may lead to Iran becoming involved in a war with the United States which would mean that Iran becomes another Syria or another Libya or another Iraq. Uh, the Trump administration has also uh, been talking to uh, some uh, small groups, uh, Kurdish group, Baluch groups, uh, Iranian Arab groups, and so on, uh, with the hope that they would uh, uh, create problems on uh, provinces of Iran that are on border. Uh, Sistan and Baluchistan on southeastern part of Iran, mm-hmm. uh, next to Pakistan, and Kurdistan next, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, and uh, Iranian Arabs in Khuzestan, which is Iran's old provinces. Mm-hmm. So they want to basically disintegrate Iran. They want to destroy Iran economy and uh, perhaps get it involved in a, uh, in a destructive war in order to save Iranian people. I mean, that's, that's also totally ridiculous. All right, y'all. Here's who sponsors this show. Mike Swanson, author of The War State, The Rise of the Military Industrial Complex in America After World War II. It's just great. And also he gives investment advice at wallstreetwindow.com. Subscribe there. And uh, when you do, you'll want to follow his advice and buy some precious metals for your savings. You go to Roberts and Roberts Brokerage Inc. RRBI.co and tell him Scott sent you. Read No Dev, No Ops, No IT by Hussein Badak Chani. How to run your IT business like a libertarian. Zencash at Zencash.com or Zensystem.io and the bumpersticker.com. Stickers for your band or your business or whatever you need. The bumpersticker.com. And if you want a new 2018 model website and you want to save some money, go to expanddesigns.com slash Scott and you'll save five hundred bucks. Well, and it sounds like a fool's errand anyway. I remember Seymour Hirsch back a few years ago said, look, what if the Iranians came and started backing like southern pro-Confederate type groups or whatever and, and said, here, let's turn you against the USA without the understanding that actually these Confederate flag waving southerners are the most patriotic Americans of all. They're not going to exactly. overthrow the government even under Barack Obama, no matter how – how much discontent there is about any particular leader or or any set of leaders in Washington, D.C. The center will hold. The U.S. Republic is not about to disintegrate, despite my best wishes. Um, you know, we exactly. could have we could have three presidents impeached in a row. That wouldn't lead to the end of the Constitution and the, the disintegration of the 50 states. And, and it's, it's the same in Iran. Uh, if the Islamic Republic is to be replaced, it has to be replaced through a process taken by Iranian people inside Iran. What the Trump administration doesn't understand is that uh, Iranian people reject both their intervention and also a lot of policies by their government. It's not either or. They can reject both of them. But their mentality is that you are either with us or against us. What they really want, in my view, and this is, this is the view that is shared by a lot of Iranians, at least within Iran, and I have a lot of contacts within Iran that, that I talk to all the time. What they really want is total capitulation by Iran. Uh, Pompeo gave this speech last May in which he listed uh, 12 demands. Now, aside from the fact that all of these 12 demands, at least 9 or 10 of them were basically baseless, but any uh, self-respecting political system or government or nation that would look at these 12 demands would see immediately that what they want is total capitulation by Iran and, and Iranian people. What they want, the Trump administration wants, in my view, and this is the view that is shared again by a lot of Iranians, is that the Trump administration together with Saudi Arabia, Israel, and United Arab Emirates, want to dictate what's happening in the Middle East and want to dictate who can do what and who cannot do uh, uh, whatever. So basically they want to bring Iran into the fold and say that you do uh, what, what we tell you. And as I said, uh, Iranian people can reject both. They can reject a lot of policies, uh, um, the that the uh, government
government in Tehran has, including the uh, you know the corruption and including the uh, uh, violation of human rights and so on, and at the same time reject the uh, policy of the Trump at, uh, uh, administration. Let us also remember that despite all the problems that the political system in Iran has, Iran is still a far more open society than any other uh, ally that the United States has in that region, with the possible exception of Israel. But even Israel is moving in a very, uh, what I consider to be a wrong direction. You know, they just passed law about Israel being the nation state of Jewish people, uh, which has been condemned by a lot of uh, people, including supporters of Israel in this country. Just this morning, I was reading that even Alan Dershowitz, uh, who is an ardent supporter of Israel, thought that this is the wrong law. Uh, that really? Was, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. That's it, even Alan Dershowitz has, has condemned it. I mean, so you can see how bad this law has been. So uh, even Israel is going in the in the wrong direction, taken over by extremists, uh, and you know, destroying any possibility of peace between. Uh, Israelis and Palestinians, uh, uh, the people of both, of course, deserve peace, and they should have their own state and so on. And Iran regularly holds elections. These elections are not completely democratic, of course. They're restricted, but these elections are competitive. They are, me- they are meaningful. They have meaning. They have implications. They have consequences. So, and Iranian people, as I said, are in a struggle to basically uh, improve the system, move it towards being more democratic, moving right. towards uh, being... It's there. worth mentioning, too, here, that as we've covered on the show, as you've done such great writing over the years, Iran never had a nuclear weapons program at all. And yes. since 2015, their civilian safeguarded nuclear program has been double extra super locked down beyond any reason, beyond any historical precedent by the international inspectors. And, you know, the Americans say they want a better deal. The, the, the Trump, in fact, Trump said the other day after threatening war, or, you know, even nuclear war, it seemed like on Twitter. Um, he then gave a speech to the American Legion, I think it was, where he said, no, I want to talk with him. We could talk and I just want a better deal than the one we had before, um, yes. which seems ridiculous. We had a great deal and there's no way the Iranian. In fact, I think Rouhani even said, I'm not giving in. I'm not even going to talk to you under these kind of threats right now. Forget it. So um, it seems like a, a pretty big mistake they're making there when, as we know, it's the nuclear program has always just been a pretext. We have I have the audio here somewhere of John Bolton on a conference call from 2007 with the American Israel Public Affairs Committee saying that unfortunately all our new sanctions and threats have failed to provoke the Iranians to withdraw from the non-proliferation treaty and their safeguards agreement, which is what we were trying to get them to do, which would be which would put us in a more advantageous position meaning would give him a better pretext for war. Exactly. I mean, that's what that's what Bolton had actually uh, prescribed. Uh, you know, th- they wanted to provoke uh, the Islamic Republic uh, to exit from the nuclear agreement, uh, and that didn't happen uh, simply because the Rouhani administration and, in fact, the entire Iranian political establishment reached the conclusion that it is in Iran's national interest uh, to follow the nuclear agreement. And let me tell you that this nuclear agreement that was signed in 2015 not only has put Iran's nuclear program, as you pointed out, under the most restrictive conditions, and it's being monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week by the agency, but it has also opened other places in Iran that International Atomic Energy Agency wanted to visit in the past and Iranian government used to do it. Iran has signed the additional protocol in the past uh, that would allow agency to visit any place in Iran that it wants if it has reasonable uh, reason to to suspect something. Right. But during the Mahmoud Ahmadinejad uh, administration, Iran suspended the, uh, its membership uh, in the additional protocol. But, the, but as a result of the nuclear agreement in July of 2015, Iran agreed to uh, restart implementing uh, the provisions of additional protocol. One re- re- result of that, for example, was that the agency uh, quietly uh, inspected 
two major Iranian universities over the past uh, few months. One, one is Sharif University, which is the best science and technology university in Iran, and had long been suspected of being involved in uh, uh, nuclear research and nuclear activities. And they visited that they didn't find anything. The other one was Iran University of Science and Technology, where uh, the IRGC uh, supposedly had uh, Institute of Applied, uh, uh, Applied Physics many, many years ago that had been accused of uh, purchasing dual-use equipment, importing it from Europe, and then pass it on to uh, IRGC or Iran Atomic Energy, uh, Energy Organization mm-hmm. for nuclear research, uh, which was, of course, baseless, but uh, the additional implementation of additional protocol allowed uh, the agency to go and inspect very carefully Institute of Applied uh, applied physics at that university, again, they didn't find anything. Right. So as, as you pointed out completely correctly, Iran has abided by every word, every letter of uh, the nuclear agreement delivered on it. And this is something that even, uh, um, you know, officials of Trump administration, from former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson to James Mattis, the president, defense secretary, and so on, uh, admit but they cannot find, uh, because they cannot find any, uh, any excuse uh, to, to bomb Iran, they, they couldn't, uh, as you said, provoke Iran to exit the nuclear agreement. So what they do is they, uh, you know, they uh, find other excuses, like Iran's uh, missile program, uh, which in my view is a totally defensive uh, program, because right. Iran doesn't have uh, an air force. Uh, to, uh, to speak of, Iran doesn't have uh, modern weapons. That yeah, just all that 14s Richard Nixon gave them. <laughs> exactly. These are, these, are, these are all weapons that Iran bought in the 1970s. Yep. And since then, Iran has been under uh, 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 an arm embargo. And yep. nobody sells them modern weapons. Even Russia, that has very close relationship with Iran, uh, uh, doesn't doesn't sell modern weapons, but modern fighters, and so on. So the only defensive deterrent that they have is their their missile program, which is basically homegrown, and they want Iran to strip that uh, deterrent also. Uh, whereas this is completely defensive. Even Pentagon, in its annual report on a state of uh, military affairs in the Middle East, that submits to to Congress every June has always said that Iran's military doctrine is uh, completely defensive. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mohammed. Able- I have to cut you off and leave them wanting more right now because I am so late for my next interview. Um, no problem. I, I'm really sorry about that, but uh, I hope people will go and check out your great article. It's Pompeo's Ridiculous Crocodile Tears for the Iranian People. It's at antiwar.com. Thank you very much again, Mohammed. Appreciate it. Thank you, Scott. All right, you guys, the great Mohammed Sahimi. All right, y'all, that's it for the show. Check me out at libertarianinstitute.org, scotthorton.org, antiwar.com, twitter.com, slash Scott Horton Show. Appreciate it. And buy my book, Fool's Errand, Timed and the War in Afghanistan.